wonderful to be here today. I would first like to thank the uh, Scandinavian House for organizing this wonderful event. Great turnout. Uh, thank them for inviting me. Ambassadors, it's great to see you here. Christina, thanks for hosting the event. And uh, I'm looking forward to listening to the other speakers. Uh, if I could have the first slide. Let me see, maybe I should do that. Or... I do a lot of teaching to students, so I like to st st stand at the front of the stage. And if you do have burning questions, you can even raise your hand. But we'll have some time afterwards to uh, hopefully take some questions. Today, I'm going to talk about this fascinating molecule, the DNA molecule. And uh, it's, uh, Icelanders are in a unique situation. Uh, and uh, it's not a coincidence that genetics is big in Iceland. And I'll tell you a little bit about why that is. But this molecule is truly uh, an informative molecule. This is really what unites us all as living beings, not only as humans, but all as living beings. Uh, Christina was talking about the purity of the population in Iceland. I was a little nervous coming to Hungary talking about genetics in, in the Scandinavian population. But I think actually the moral of the story is we are much more alike than we, than we are different. Uh, but this molecule is so informative. If I would get DNA molecule from every living being that has ever been on Earth, we would be able to put them into a hierarchy, connecting a family tree that connects us all the way back to the beginning of life. So this uh, DNA molecule is truly informative, both with regard to the past and what we're seeing more and more, that we can use it in some ways to help us predict the future, especially with regard to healthcare. Mm. So here you can see actually three very close relatives. <laughs> this one here, you might recognize on the stage. And here are my relatives, the bonobo and the chimpanzee, all part of a primate family. And uh, really, you might think in some ways, because we always think of us as special, that we see a big difference here. But actually, when we look inwards, we see that we actually share 99% of our DNA. 99%, uh, obviously, there's a lot of similarities. But when we think about there are 3 billion base pairs, this 1% re re then represents about 30 million base pairs that are different. Sounds like a lot, but when you put it into a context of 3 billion base pairs, there's much more similarity than difference. And if we move on to one of the members of this family here, and look at him here 50 years earlier, it's a picture of me with my mother here and my father. If the same way, if I could get the DNA of my mother and my father, I would be able to tell, and actually, I am able to tell if I would be able to decode the information that is present in the decode company, I would be able to see which of every letter that I got from my father and every letter that I got from my mother, you can mix it in, and this is the human being that you see standing in front of you today. This is the information we have in the DNA molecule does obviously not predict whatever happens in my life. But it does affect very many aspects. It affects my risks of getting many diseases. Some of these risks are uh, truly predicted in the DNA. Some of them are only partially predicted in the DNA. But it's not only diseases. It's character. It's outward features of many sorts that uh, are really determined by the DNA molecule. But at the same time, it's important to understand that these are, these are most often, in most cases, these are not determinants, but predictors that can uh, kind of predict whether you're more likely to do this or that. And I told you that uh, genetics in Iceland is truly in a unique situation, or unique uh, uh, position. Part of the reason for that is that we Icelanders, we know our ancestry. Actually, uh, we can trace our ancestry such that I can connect myself, usually by going about six to seven generations up, to all other Icelanders that are part of the same genetic family tree. And uh, so this, re 
uh, and this information can now be harvested to, to use for medical research, and this has been done so in the last 20 years. So this is just a schematic to see you how these family trees are built up. This is just a schematic, but if you imagine that this is the family tree of all living Icelanders, we can piece this together here, and uh, we can build this family tree. Now the question is, if we get the DNA on these individuals, can we start figuring out which of the variations are associated with which diseases or other features that we want to look at? For example, crossword puzzle. Cro the, the, uh, the ability to solve crossword puzzles is partially determined by DNA. There was a paper on that from Beco Genetics. So. And uh, further, if we go backwards here, Iceland was settled about 874, were the first settlers. Here's one of the f f first uh, and most famous Icelanders, A.S. Skatlagrimsson, a famous poet. If we go 28 legs back from me here, I can connect, connect myself to A.S. Skatlagrimsson through 28 generations. And this is something that all Icelanders can do. You can trace yourself back. And uh, so this is information that was, has been uh, part of our Icelandic uh, heritage for, for all the centuries. Uh, but now people are starting to take advantage of this. So this is the company here, Deco Genetics. And uh, the University of Iceland, especially the Faculty of Medicine that I'm part of, has very close collaboration with Deco Genetics. And uh, what the, the business model of ecogenetics has essentially been is to take advantage of the information that lies in these family trees, get sequence of DNA of as many Icelanders as possible, and then get information on diseases. And this is then mixed and matched here within the, the computers in ecogenetics. And this has been used to make for the last 20 years uh, wonderful scientific discoveries on disease mutations or disease risk alleles, that is, variations in the DNA that connect to different uh, diseases that we see. Um, and if I explain a little bit the sequencing part of this. So they have uh, in the freezers in decogenetics about 60% DNA from about 60% of the adult population. And uh, they have now done what's called a SNP genotype, which is a, 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 where you look at about a million different markers in the genome. And they've done this on half the population, the red dots here in this family tree. And then in the past seven years or so, what, what has happened is they've started doing what's called whole genome sequencing. So you take the DNA from an individual and you sequence all the three billion base pairs in that individual. And uh, this was, 10 years ago, a major task that it was involved. Uh, you had to involve hundreds of laboratories to do this. Now you can do this in just days, to do the whole genome sequence on an individual. And this has now been done on 45,000 individuals in Iceland. Remember, Iceland is really small. We're only 300,000. So 45,000 whole genomes. And with this information, you can actually start, if you have the green dots here, you can start predicting. The ones with the red dots, we can actually predict very precisely what the whole genome is. And even in the people with the blue dots that have never given their DNA, you can start predicting based on families what the most likely genome they do have. So this has been extremely powerful for genetic research. So we are in a unique situation. There's no population with more information available on a DNA sequence. And uh, so far, this has mostly been used to find novel association between variations or mutations and many diseases. With uh, uh, just a slew, this is one of the most, uh, uh, the, the, uh, one of the most productive labs in genetics in the world through these many major scientific discoveries. And uh, with this information, the question being asked now in the past few years, can we use this treasure trove of data to improve our healthcare? Can we start taking the DNA information and bring it back to the people instead of only use it as a tool of scientific discovery? But before we go there, let me tell you a little bit about the history of Icelanders based on what we've learned from the DNA. So, as I said, A.S. Skatlakrimsson was born in nine, 910. Uh, so he was a second generation Icelander. The first generation of Icelanders uh, are believed to have come here from Western Norway, sailed over to Iceland in 1874, the first settlement. 
And this was documented very uh, precisely uh, in uh, some of the old Icelandic saga, the Book of Settlement. But we know at the same time, these Vikings, they were also uh, sailing over to northern British Isles, to Scotland, down to Ireland here, and uh, some of the Danes here went to uh, in eastern England, and uh, so there was a lot of admixture here in the populations. But in Iceland, we've all, though, always looked at us as we are part of the Scandinavian community, and we are actually uh, the, the people of, of Norway that moved away from the Norwegian king. And uh, does this hold true when we look at the DNA? So this can actually be done now. If you look at the Book of Settlements, we know that there was a significant proportion of people that came from the British Isles, about maybe 10% of those that are documented. But th those were, according to the document, mostly slaves. Uh, so people kind of believed that the genetic heritage of the Iceland today was mostly Scandinavian or from Western Norway, actually from, the, uh, from Bergen and that area. And uh, now with the genetic uh, data available, we can actually start asking very precise questions. Where do Icelanders come from? And uh, I'm not going to tell you about how we do all of these tricks, but just to point here towards this very measly here, smallest chromosome of the body. Here you can see all the chromosomes that we all carry, uh, about half the, or even probably more than half of the people here do not have this little measly chromosome here, the Y chromosome. We, uh, the women have two of these X's. But the Y chromosome is peculiar in the way that it travels only through the male lineage. So the Y chromosome here that we have in Icelanders is the same Y chromosome that moved to Iceland nine, well, about 1,100 years ago. It's only going from, so this tells us about which the population was the, uh, the male population that moved to Iceland. Then there's another trick here. Within these energy factories of the cells, the mitochondria, there are small pieces of DNA there. That DNA only travels through the females. So we can start telling, if we look at these two different pieces of information, the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA, we can tell where did the people that settled Iceland 1,100 years ago come from. And uh, the data is in. If you look here, in a very simplistic way, the Y chromosome and the, and the mitochondrial chromosome here, Norway, we paint them as black, and uh, the British one as white. Y chromosome and mitochondria. And if we look here, in the British Isles, in western Scotland and northern Scotland here, and even down towards Ireland, you can see actually the white part of the British genome has been invaded here by quite a bit of Scandinavian DNA. And you can see about both in the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial chromosome, there's about the same percentage of uh, between maybe 10, 50 percent, all the way up to maybe around uh, 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 35 to 40 percent here in the Shetland Islands. Well, what about Iceland? And we can actually ask the same question about the Faroe Islands. It turns out, yes, the book, book of settlement was right, that the Y chromosome is mostly Norwegian. But what about the mitochondria? It turns out that the mitochondria in Iceland are about 65 percent from the British Isles. Very surprising findings. So the story is probably, in a simplistic way, there were here single Norwegian guys that couldn't find any ladies, <laughs> sailed away from <laughs> Norway. They stopped off here and got some women and moved to Iceland. So that's the story. But um, the, uh, so this came as a, quite a bit of a surprise. There was always this story that probably there were quite a significant part of the Icelanders that came from the, the northern part of the British Isles. But uh, this number here came as a big surprise. So how did this uh, population of uh, uh, British women and Norwegian men do through the centuries? Actually, we think we're proud of Norwegian or, or our Scandinavian heritage today, but I can tell you the first 1,100 years of Icelanders were pretty miserable. The first 300 years was actually quite good. We did well for, from about 900 until just after the break of the century, about 1200. That's when the, the great culture works of the Icelandic sagas were written. They, the people were doing great, they were growing. But here, 
We don't know what happened. There was a, a loss of res natural resources, the climate change. There were a lot of different issues that came in here. We lost our independence to the nor uh, uh, lost our independence here, 1262. But you can see this happened before. This is not this decline here is not because of the Norwegian king. I think it's the other way around. And you can see here when you look at the population here. In 1404, uh, 1402, we had the plague come to Iceland, and half the population perished. Here, later on, we had the smallpox epidemic. Here, the Great Famine after uh, one of the big volcanic eruptions. So you can see here, from uh, about 1200, the population is actually, for many hundred years, is just slowly declining. It's not until the mid-1800s that the population finally starts to grow and uh, prosper. Uh, so, you can ask the question, is this population here in Iceland, 330,000, are these the same Icelanders that came here? And it turns out that if we look at the DNA that we find in the skeletons of the, of the, uh, the Norwegian, or these settlers in Iceland, uh, uh, when we look at the contemporary Icelanders, there's actually quite a bit of difference. It's not that we've had any import of DNA, we essentially have a weeding them, so a lot of this DNA has disappeared. And if you look at contemporary Scandinavians, so my uh, fellow speakers here today, especially from Norway, who would look at his DNA, his DNA is probably more similar to ancient Icelanders than my DNA, at least the Scandinavian part. And the same holds true for, for contemporary British people from the northern part of, of, of England, their DNA today is more similar to the British part of the, the ancient Icelandic DNA. So this happened through these great bottlenecks and famines and all these things that happened, reduced a lot the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, plentiful of the, the DNA that was present in the ancient Icelanders. So come back to this slide here. Can we use this treasure trove uh, of data to improve our healthcare? So moving from history to the future. This has been a catchphrase for the last 10 years, personalized medicine. Another word that has now been picking up is precision medicine. What is meant by this? Obviously, when we talk about personalized medicine, we always want our medicine or our healthcare to be personalized. But when people talk about personalized medicine, people are mostly talking about preventive or therapeutic decisions based on the context of the patient's genetic context. Can you use this genetic context to help you predict which are the most likely diseases, and how to focus your health care in that individual. So I'm using it here in this term, personalized medicine. So can we use this treasure trove data in Iceland on DNA to uh, uh, guide our health care? Uh, in regular health care, we actually have been, in, for many years, been actually dealing with similar things, although not based on DNA. In cardiovascular uh, diseases, so heart attacks and so forth, We've mostly been focusing on what are called the risk factors rather than the disease itself. We know if a patient has high blood, uh, blood fats, the hypercholesterolemia, or high blood pressure, we know that treating those conditions can help you prevent the heart attack. It's not the high blood pressure per se that you're interested in. You're treating it because you want to prevent the heart attack. So these are the type of preventive uh, medical interventions that we've been doing for many decades. In cancer, in breast cancer, for example, we have a lot of known risk factors, but those, those are very difficult to modify. So how do we do preventive medicine in breast cancer? We do this by setting up screening programs. So we know that if we diagnose a breast cancer early, you can diagnose it before it is a deadly disease, and you can cure it uh, rather easily. So you can do screening programs to detect the, the disease at an early stage. So now the question is, can we start using this DNA information to kind of incorporate into these type of healthcare measures? But the first question we have to ask though is, should we use this information coded in the DNA to help us improve healthcare? And actually that question in many cases has been answered. We are already in many of the rarer hereditary conditions, we are already doing this. If a patient gets uh, diagnosed with a rare condition in the DNA, you already look in the family and try to come up with ways to prevent it in other family members. Uh, so, I think a lot of people think that yes, we should use the information, but how can we do it when we have the whole population 
available. How can we use the information coded in the DNA to help us improve healthcare? And uh, I think it's very important that this is not a private decision for healthcare professionals to uh, take, but we need a broad consensus in the population. Uh, this was brought in the forefront when Angelina Jolie wrote uh, actually a wonderful uh, opinion page, op-ed page in uh, uh, the New York Times about her decision about uh, having a diagnosis of the BRCA gene that was known to be in her mother. And her mother died at the age of 56 from cancer. And uh, she wrote a very important, I think, uh, uh, op-ed piece in, in, uh, uh, in the New York Times. And uh, this got a lot of attention. And she actually had then a prophylactic mastectomy. So both the breasts were removed. She had then a, a, a reconstruction of the breast tissue. And uh, by that decision has reduced her chances of getting a breast cancer by over 90%. It's, I shouldn't say controversial, but it, th this is one of the options you have. And I'll discuss how we could possibly get, uh, use this in Iceland. So, Instead of taking the information from the individuals and putting it here, can we start taking it back and use this information for clinical care? And let me just give you a, a couple of uh, examples of uh, how we could uh, start thinking about this. When we think about the mutations and, and variations in the DNA, we have here, these are the important ones because even though they are rare, these are the ones that are closely associated with diseases. So have a high risk. If you carry the gene, there's a high risk that you will get the disease. And the second question you have to ask when you're looking at these, is it clinically actionable? Do we have an intervention that we can do to help the individual if you have this information? And for several of the genes, for example, the BRCA gene that Angelina Jolie had, or has, we actually do have a clinical actionable uh, 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 treatments available. So just to show you here actual numbers from Iceland. So the, the BRCA gene that is associated with breast cancer is present in 1,200 women. About three, 400 of those know that they have the BRCA gene, so the rest they don't know. This information is available in the computer in decode. It's in a decoded way so that we don't know which individuals they are, but if we had a consensus in the population, we could break the code, get the information, and bring it back to the population, and tell the women that have their gene that yes, you have it, and uh, you uh, we could use it in preventive measures. Same here for uh, a much less discussed, but also an important uh, uh, genetic condition that is associated with colon cancer. And uh, so here we are with these 1,200 women. They have about 12 years reduction in their lifetime risk by carrying this gene, about a 13-fold increased risk of breast cancer, and 10-fold increased risk of getting ovarian cancer. We know if we take these women, or if we provide this information to women, and they could go for, for example, what's called high-risk screening. Screening every six months, we can catch the uh, breast cancer early and catch it at a treatable stage. Or going for a, a more, is the, prophylactic, uh, 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 is the prophylactic mastectomy that Angelina and Joni did, quite a dramatic procedure, but a very powerful way of preventing the disease from coming. And this does not only apply to the BRCA gene associated with breast cancer. So the, the, the colon cancer, sorry, I told you about, Lynch syndrome. Then there are a long list. There are about, the, the list today is about 27 to 28 different genes that I think everybody agrees that are high risk and we have actionable ways to do something preventing for this, for these uh, population. Just to name a few, for example, sudden cardiac death syndromes. So these are young people under the age of 40 that drop down with a heart attack. That's most often due to some genetic condition. Iron overload, uh, a fairly common genetic condition, an inherited high cholesterol associated with heart attacks at a very early age. We can start using genetics to predict which medications are best for the patient in some cases, but not all. So these are some of the examples. So in the end, if we want to use this, how should we do this? And this is actually what we are discussing today. I'm actually on a government committee that is discussing this. How can we use this information? And how do we do it in practical terms? Do we start contacting people with possible mutations? Especially with the people that we don't even have a blood sample on. This is very controversial. Privacy issues, obviously. The right not to know. There's a right to know, but there's also a right not to know. So this is, these are issues that we are kind of dealing with and tackling now. 
Should we require to people to seek the information? That's from an ethical standpoint, a fairly uncontroversial way of doing it. And maybe the biggest question, will this affect the health care, both the quality and the cost, increase or decrease? We don't know the answer to it. We know, for example, with the BRCA gene, if we find it early, we actually lower the health care cost. But I'm, I don't know what the answer here is. Will this increase? And with uh, all the money that goes into health care, these are really important questions. So on this note, I want to stop and uh, finally just want to thank uh, my friend and uh, the head of DECODE, uh, Kauri Stephenson, who has actually done a quite uh, amazing uh, job in these past 20 years, a heroic job that uh, is very difficult to describe. Atnar Helgason, he is the head of anthropo anthropology at DECODE Genetics, and he provided all the data for me on the, the, the settlement of Icelanders. And with that, I would like to thank you. Okay, just wanted to grab the moment and the mic for one question, and then I'd like to give it to the audience. While you were talking, uh, this old joke came to my mind when the American president visits an elementary school, mm -hmm. and one of the kids says that, my dad told me we don't like you because you scan too much private information, and the president answers, he's not your dad. <laughs> So what can you do with all this information that you have yeah. that would make us alarmed? I'm mm -hmm. a journalist, yes. so yeah. I, mm -hmm. I'm really yeah. interested in yeah. private... So, so what are the sensitive issues? Uh, the, um, I mean, obviously, those type of questions, you know, is your dad really your dad? You're always you know, pretty sure about the mother, but the, the, the father part is always... Uh, but actually... Uh, uh, this has been looked at a decode, not for each individual, but looked at statistically based on the family trees. How correct is it? And it turns out, at least in Iceland, it is actually very correct. It's over, it's, I don't remember exactly the numbers, but I think they're over 90, 97 to 99% correct, which if you flip it over, maybe 2 to 3% are incorrect. And, uh, but that's not the type of information that we are interested in, obviously. And uh, the thing could is... Could you be? You are not, but could you be? Could you be? the um, Well, all the data that is collected is uh, based on what the, uh, the, the Icelandic Science Committee allows you to do. So whenever you are uh, uh, using this information, you can only use it for the purposes that the Icelandic Science Committee allows you to do. What exactly is the information that you can have? Sequences data, clinical information, mm -hmm. phenotypical data, yes. drug reaction data. What else? Uh, the, um, essentially, uh, it is based on uh, the scientific interests of the people that are asking the scientific questions. Uh, those are... I, Do you have I, a consensus about that? Uh, the, and let me come back. So whenever you're working with the DNA of the individual, that has to be based on an informed consent from that individual, yes. So uh, uh, if you're using his DNA, he has to have said in a written down consent, yes, you can use it for these and these studies, or there's, it can even have a broad consent that you can use it for a variety of, of diseases. And then for each and every condition, you go to the science committee and ask, uh, is this OK if I ask this question? Is it anonymous? It's, uh, yes, it is. Anonymous, but you can, so the uh, uh, data protection authority actually carries the key. So the people that are working with the data have no idea who it is, but if you are getting information, for example, from the hospital, the, the, uh, uh, the personal uh, protection, or the protection uh, uh, authority breaks the code and connects them together. I was uh, looking mm -hmm. into his research, your mm -hmm. colleague, yes. and let me quote him. Mm -hmm. Stefansson said somewhere that he hopes that the need for anonymity will soon change. Mm -hmm. We have the insight into the genome of all Icelanders today, he said, and one of the big questions is how can society take advantage of it? Mm -hmm. There are some obstacles that society has to get over before it, we will use it. Is the obstacle anonymity? Um, the it depends on a lot, we're talking, these very technical terms when we talk about anonymity. So one type of is to remove all identifications and you can never connect data to it again. That's kind of the most strict one. And I think people that are doing medical research 
uh, and this is not only in Iceland, this is genetics all, all over Europe, is people do not want, when you do sequence data, that you uh, disconnect all possible ways of connecting it to further information. But, um, so these are technical issues that are somewhat difficult to deal with, and I I'm not here to, uh, to uh, stand here and uh, uh, defend whatever Kauri Stephenson has said, because he's a very controversial figure. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> but, the, but let me just tell you, I think the, uh, the reason this has been possible in Iceland, and I think this is probably easier in a lot of the Scandinavian countries, is trust. Trust in not only government, but trust within society. So I think that's the most important part, is if you have, for example, erosion of trust, towards authority or towards the scientific community, what happens is participation in research really goes down. So uh, here, I think we do have trust within the Icelandic population. This can erode, but it's a really important issue is to have trust. I think now you understand my questions coming from a Hungarian <laughs> journalist in the Hungarian society. Yeah. And let me give you the floor to the Hungarian audience. Mm -hmm. One of... Uh, the question is here first. Do we need to have the mic? She has the mic, and he does too. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. It's very impressive. So I have, uh, so I have one question. So it's like I want to know: uh, just uh, have you ever raised any practical proposal to the authority who take charge of the healthcare? And another question is like, what do you think of the possibility to connect the genetic project with the blockchain? You know, it's like the new cutting edge of the technology. So what, blockchain. Blood. Chain. Blockchain. Blockchain. Uh, anybody has an idea of blockchain? Yeah. I didn't. <laughs> mm. Okay, I know it's just the first question might be. You know, you know the, I, I, I try to describe it as a blockchain like you share, you know, for the, uh, how to say, the public health care, you share the information together, mm -hmm. but they have some, uh, some, how to say, they have some secret, you, you can't, it's not the public faced access to the yeah. data, okay. but you have the blockchain, it's like uh, the okay. data yeah. is in the pool, yes. but you yeah. can access individually, yeah. uh -huh. but with the code. Yeah. The, I think everybody agrees that DNA information is always going to be in a very separate category with regard to how you deal with that, uh, how you kind of uh, uh, handle that data. Uh, what I think is increasingly happening, and it's, uh, it's a very complex issue, is individuals are much more asking themselves to get this information, which is, I think, fine and important, but the uh, issue is... Uh, uh, one of the issues is the information that you carry as an individual on your DNA is also informative on your family members. So even though it's private, it's also private to your family members. So these are just issues that make it a little more complex to deal with, with regard to sharing information on DNA. Uh, so, uh, but there's no doubt that the population is probably moving faster than the scientific community and the medical community with regard to asking to get this information. Good, power to the people, but these are just, these are the issues that we're dealing with is the sensitive nature often of, of uh, the information, information, get, information gathered, especially when you're dealing with some of these high-risk mutations. While everybody is thinking, I have one more question. Um, you have a homogeneous society, as we've mentioned a couple of times, and you're very small, a little more than 300,000 people. So if you wanted to um, broaden this research, you need 
more diverse communities and larger numbers and more genomes. Do you have other partners, other countries? And if I remember correctly, President Obama in 2014 announced some big amount for this kind of research. Mm -hmm. I don't know if President Trump believes in such kind of thing and if he wanted to put aside some money. And how about other European countries? Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the resource that is most used now with regard to confirming a lot of the genetic findings, for example, found in decogenetics, is through what's called the UK Biobank. So UK has been very um, uh, on the cutting edge in, in, in genetics as well. And uh, they have what's called the UK Biobank, and they've actually put online a very anonymized data, but it's, that is linked to a lot of clinical information. So whenever you have a finding, for example, at Decode, you can ask, is that variant uh, available in the UK population? And this has been done, done routinely with uh, pr pretty much all the research at Decode. Uh, increasingly, there are, there are a lot of research groups in, in the Scandinavian countries, and uh, I think that's our simplest partner to go to because we, that's, they are next of kin, essentially. And, uh, for example, to do these, what we call imputations, predicting D DNA uh, sequences into the families, which Decode is very good at because they've been doing it now for 20 years. They are now starting to work with a lot of the Scandinavian groups and, and trying to do this in a more heterogeneous population where it's more complex. Thank you. Do you guys have any other questions? Yeah, so my question is, uh, is, is a practical one. So if, if I would like to start down the road and, and, and you know, sequence my genome and get information about that that is relevant for my healthcare. Uh, there are service providers on the market who have mm -hmm. started to do that. As a scientist, what are your recommendations in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in finding a service provider that we could trust? Mm -hmm. the, um, I think most of the commercial providers today are uh, they are under somewhat strict uh, laws of what type of information they can give out. Uh, and some of it has to do with, for example, usually in these commercial kits, they are not looking at the most important mutations that, for example, the BRCA genes and the ones that are associated with high risk of disease. Uh, so uh, I actually got this question earlier this morning. Uh, they are very good at helping you tell where you come from. Uh, they can give you a little bit of feeling for whether you are a little more at risk of getting prostate cancer or diabetes. But how valid they are clinically remains to be answered. And I think most people in the field would say that these have not had any stood, withstood any tests of clinical uh, uh, validation so far. So uh, a lot of companies are moving in this direction, but the clinical validity, I think, is highly controversial. Any more questions? There. Hi there. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my only question would be that, uh, well, first of all, I always like scientists like yourself, enthusiastic and passionate about what you do, but practically the way corporations works and especially research and development I assume you have a contract um, which means that you're the smart guy you come up with all kinds of new ideas and prove them but at the end of the day the owner of your your ideas is going to be the company now since this is a very new and controversial topic and field do you have any assurance that, for example, with all the best intentions, you're researching breast cancer, but you accidentally come up, you know, realizing how to kill all the empathy in a human being, and your company decides to sell that knowledge to an authoritarian government to breed, I don't know, mindless killers or something? It's a very extreme example, of course, but. What I'm asking is that, do these kind of concerns play a part in your everyday research, the way you conduct and focus on things? This, uh, just from a practical standpoint, there was, there was a lot of interest and there were a lot of money in patenting of genes about 15 years ago. This is actually, in the past 
10 years kind of pretty much disappeared. Part of it is because the value, people have realized that the value in the genetic information in finding a very precise medication has proven to be very complex, usually from your uh, scientific finding of finding a gene and finding a new disease or something, or finding a new cure. It's been extremely complex. So the value of the genetic information from this therapeutic standpoint has uh, not been very high. Uh, people ask, why does, so uh, let me tell you, Ecogenetic is now owned by a pharmaceutical company, Amgen, one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies. How do they use it? They have no interest in the genome of Icelanders. What they are interested in is, is there any information there that give them a clue about a new pathway that can be used to find a new medication? So that's the type of information that the pharmaceutical company is interested in. The, uh, uh, and Icelanders ask a lot. So this information that is now in, do we have to pay to get it? Uh, it turns out that the company and everybody involved in the company realized that there's no value in trying to sell the Icelandic population this information. There's much more value in the knowledge that is generated by this. And that's, um, I don't want to sound simplistic or naive. Uh, we have to be very careful about these issues. These, these are ongoing decisions. Uh, uh, so, we have to be alert and conscious and uh, very kind of uh, take great cares when we're dealing with this. Thank you. You said you know what the pharmaceutical company is interested in. Are you sure you know what the pharmaceutical company is interested in? Um, well, you're never sure what another entity or individual actually is interested in, uh, but what my read of it is, and what they have done so far, I know that the information they have gotten from this is, uh, has affected the way, kind of what pathways are going with their drug development based on information. Thank you. The question is up there. Thank you. Uh, uh, can you and uh, how uh, avoid inbreeding in Iceland? Mm. The, uh, well, we are partially inbreeded. The, do, is there a medical problem with that? We are, believe it or not, a big enough population so we don't get a lot of these major inbreeding problems within the, the population. But we have a lot of what's called founder mutations, which are one of the definition of inbreeding. Uh, but what do we do about it? Well, obviously the best thing to do is to get more people to move to Iceland, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. We don't have more time for questions. Let's give a big applause to the professor.